The story begins with our protagonist begging the old man not to die, then he directs his gaze to a person named Luna while staring at her with eyes full of hatred, saying he will never forgive her, absolutely won't, even though he loved her. However, all of this seems to have been just a dream of our protagonist, who upon opening his eyes says he dreamed it again while holding his head worried. He tells us that unfortunately now he has an even worse headache because he must marry one of the ten brides his father found for him while breaking off the engagements with the rest one by one. This is really stressful, however, the protagonist is lucky because having ten brides is literally insane. Later, we encounter this girl who considers herself lucky because John showed her boyfriend's son Keeman's true character, a scoundrel who was two-timing her, and she had to quickly end the relationship. A few seconds later, the girl arrives home and realizes her parents are arguing with someone, saying he is not worthy of their daughter and needs to look at himself. The girl doesn't understand what's happening and asks. It is revealed that the person they are arguing with is our protagonist who, upon seeing the girl, introduces himself as her fiancé. This leaves the girl shocked and her father explains that her grandfather arranged the marriage before he died and he swore to honor. However, the wife does not agree and believes that only son Kimen is worthy of their daughter since the San family is one of the four main families in the city of Gennaro. The girl, who had already broken up with son Kimen, tries to explain that there is a misunderstanding since she is not there to get married but rather to break off the engagement, which irritates the lady. She asks the protagonist if he doesn't think about her daughter's happiness, which leaves him embarrassed. The girl named Frun interrupts and asserts that it is 2028 and she is in charge of her marriage, deciding what will happen from now on. However, the protagonist announces that he is withdrawing from the marriage and says goodbye to everyone before he can leave. Sun Kimen arrives, Frun's supposed boyfriend. Mrs. Alborough is pleased with his timely arrival and grants permission for him to take Frun for a walk. Sun Kimen notices the protagonist and asks if he is related to them. The lady, a little worried about revealing the protagonist's identity, says he is. However, before she can finish her sentence, Fran interrupts to say that the protagonist is her husband, surprising everyone, including the protagonist. He asks incredulously since she is his girlfriend and if she wants to marry someone, she should marry him, which is somewhat logical since he is supposedly her boyfriend. However, the girl continues to deny this and calls him a scoundrel. She says she feels like she's dirtying her mouth by saying another word. So, the protagonist grabs her arm to leave, well, to leave with him. I sincerely hope the girl doesn't regret this because the, at first glance, she seems very confident in what she's saying, however, while she is sure of what she's doing, her mother isn't. She asks, what the hell is she doing asking to come back? But the girl, ignoring her mother's words, leaves the place with the protagonist, leaving everyone speechless. Processing what happened, the annoyed guy tells the lady that she should remember that the dowry of 300 million from his family is for the Huden family, sincerely hoping they can handle the marriage because they know what will happen if they don't. The lady, who knows very well what will happen if it doesn't happen, tells him not to worry because they know what they're doing. As they walk, the protagonist, passing by Linfen and the girl, can observe that while they move away, the protagonist tells the girl they are far enough to leave. However, when the protagonist was about to do so, upon touching her neck, he felt a familiar point. This surprised him a bit since he had only seen this unique meridian once when he was a child. To clear his doubts, he asks the girl if someone bit her on the neck when she was a child, words that surprise the girl, who stops and asks how he knows that. The protagonist tells her that he knows because he visited her when she was a child and he was the one who bit her. The girl, upon hearing this, rebukes him, asking how he dares to mention that matter, almost hitting him. However, before she can do that, he stops her, gets close, and asks if she remembers her mother. These words make the girl go back to her childhood when she cried and told the protagonist's mother that he intimidated her and bit her. In her memory, she begged her not to cry, apologizing. The protagonist, upon remembering this, tells Linfen that from what he remembers, her mother was a very kind and beautiful woman, which leaves Linfen curious. She starts asking many questions, and in her questions, she asks if she remembers anything else since her mother disappeared on the day she asked if someone took her away or where was the last time she saw her. This causes the girl to be bombarded with many questions and she responds by saying that if he wants to know, there is a condition, he must marry her and get the certificate. Some time later, we find out that the girl convinced the protagonist because as they walked, he told her that he gave her what she wanted. And now it's time for her to tell him what she wants. The girl asks for a moment 
saying she first needs to sort out some pending issues. After sending a photo to her boyfriend to show that she got married, she thanks the protagonist and says she will now tell him everything she knows. However, before she can do so, she receives a text message and upon seeing it, she becomes quite worried, telling the protagonist they need to go to her house first. Shortly afterward, the girl arrives home and upon entering, she asks her parents why all her cards have been frozen. Her father, showing the photo she sent to her boyfriend, says that's why. Her mother scolds her for it, saying she's trying to bankrupt them since the $300 million request from the SBA family disappeared, and it's her fault for breaking up with her boyfriend. However, even though the situation is a bit tense, the girl does not retract her words because she tells her mother that she saw with her own eyes her boyfriend holding a foreign girl in his arms. Furthermore, she believes her boyfriend was just playing with her, and therefore, she thinks he's not worth it, calling him garbage. Her mother, faced with this, says that even if that's the case, a request for $300 million can increase the family's value by 30%, and therefore, you can't afford to fight with the family. The girl hears this from her own mother in a different way as she lets tears run down her face. She sadly asks her mother if she's trying to sell her, questioning if she's still her mother. The protagonist, seeing how the situation is unfolding, asks if it's just $300 million, saying that amount is not a problem for him as he will provide it himself. However, Mrs. S., upon hearing that Lennon will provide the money, says it's 300 million, not 300, questioning what he thinks he is. Doubtfully, she asks if he intends to be an L, something unspecified in the story, and the protagonist, as he literally married her daughter and has the certificate to prove it, shows that he does. And so the protagonist says it's a piece of cake, and tomorrow at the same time, the $300 million will be there. Mrs. S tells the protagonist that if he does so, then she will give him her daughter, but if not, he'll have to die in front of Sang's eyes. The girl, while wiping away tears, tells the protagonist they should leave there, which upsets her father because he says he can accompany the protagonist to say goodbye but she can't go with him. However, the girl once again ignores her father's words and takes the protagonist with her. When they're outside, the girl seems not to believe the protagonist very much and asks if he's going to run away, which the protagonist denies. Instead, he takes her phone, changes the number, and tells her that since he saved her number, someone will contact her. He gives her back the phone and says he will definitely keep his promise to her and her father, but she mustn't forget what she promised him which is to talk about her mother after saying goodbye to the girl. Lin Fame, who was nearby, says that half of the richest people in the city live there. The protagonist plans to use this opportunity to make money, and to do so quickly. He crashes through a wall onto private property where a man is training. However, the protagonist informs the man that it's a shame he developed his dark energy but has internal injuries preventing him from progressing in life. However, as Lin invaded private property, the man asks who he is and prepares to use his white soul before doing so, the man stops him and asks the protagonist if he can see with the naked eye that there's something wrong with his body, which the protagonist confirms, saying he can see it and even heal his internal injuries. However, the price to heal him is about 300 million. The man doesn't believe much in that and asks the protagonist's father not to listen to the protagonist's nonsense. To prove he's not talking nonsense, the protagonist gathers energy in his hand and directs it at the man. The father, upon seeing the protagonist send his son flying with his energy, is impressed and realizes the protagonist is a master. Approaching the protagonist, the father says that $300 million are nothing to him, asking when he will deliver it and how long it will take to heal Lin Fen. As Lin Fen examines him, he informs that his wound is not easy to treat and will take at least half a month to heal, which is too long for him. And Senor doesn't think the same way as the protagonist because he is shocked to hear that it will only take half a month while he thinks he has been plagued by this internal wound for 20 years, and many famous doctors couldn't cure him. The protagonist asserts that he can heal him in just half a month, which is impressive to the Senor. He approaches the protagonist to examine him and make sure he's not just talking without basis. As he touches the Senor's back, he asks if it hurts, and the Senor affirms with great pain, explaining that the wound hurts every time it rains and that it's fine that day. The protagonist realizes that the senor is really suffering and without saying much, channels his energy into him, 
sending him flying. Surprisingly, the senor doesn't get hurt by the fall because he feel the energy flowing through what used to be dead flesh the protagonist approaches and asks if he would like him to do it again and senor agrees this time senor doesn't fall to the ground and stands up vigorously lm fong seeing that senor is full of energy says he will give him a prescription and will be back in a week but for now he will have to send the 300 million senor agrees without any problems at night the scene changes to ruin's house where her father comments that she has a bad eye for choosing people suggesting that the protagonist must have run away her mother also says that a loser like the protagonist who doesn't even have a decent job could never gather 300 million however. Ruin has total confidence in the protagonist and asserts that he will definitely return with the money which seems to be heard as someone knocks on the door to inform Senorita Yuck that there is a knight claiming to be from the show family waiting outside and she is surprised and thrilled to hear that he is from the show family she wonders if he could be the one she is expecting but before she finishes the sentence she jumps from her chair and rushes to open the door her parents also curious decide to take a look outside the house the man introduces himself as senor juan and he is there to discuss a request for 300 million dollars yuck's parents are shocked and wonder if the 300 million are really there they realize that Mr. Wan is the commercial representative of the show family one of the four main families and they kindly invite him in he accepts but clarifies that Mr. Show has instructed that only the miss can sign the request and Yuck is thrilled to realize that the protagonist has fulfilled his promise and brought the money not running away from the situation after signing all the papers Mr. Wan tells Yuck that someone will contact her later to advance further and he accompanies Senor Wan to the exit and thanks him for coming he kindly tells her not to worry as it is a small matter however after senor juan leaves someone approaches yuck and asks her if she received the 300 million the person is the protagonist and yuck quickly hugs him to thank him for fulfilling his promise of the story the protagonist tells him that they have to go in while they are inside the portal informs the girl's parents that he did what he promised and therefore wants to take her and Rin however things are not as easy as they seem since the girl's mother says it must have been Chan's daughter who did everything not him taking advantage of the situation he tells the protagonist that he will not hand over his daughter until he receives another order for 300 million dollars and warns the woman not to be abusive as his patience has limits ruin hearing such words from her mother with tears in her eyes she asks her what she is talking about and if she will break her word her word approaches her husband for him to see how the daughter is speaking to her when she sees this the girl is really impressed and disappointed with her parents and asks if they see her only as a commodity for which they can be blackmailed the girl seeing this side of her parents that she did not know grabs the protagonist's arm and tells him that they need to get out of there since this kind of place cannot be their home linden tells the girl not to get angry as after all they are her parents and may not be in their right mind at the moment but they will be fine when they calm down however the girl ignoring a little of what the proto says timidly asks him if his bank card and credit card were frozen and if he also has nowhere to go asking if he can take her home and in responds by telling him that his father has a small one in the middle of the city and there is an empty house there although it is in a medium state it is habitable which leaves the girl excited and grateful the next morning they go to daongan university to the academic affairs building where our protagonist is already approaching some students who are working and studying when he approaches he greets them and asks where the girl is before that he asks the protagonist if he has a date to which he replies no but that he is her friend however the boy does not not believe the protagonist and threatens to call the school security if he does not leave. The protagonist, upset with the treatment he's receiving, asks if the guy is saying he's a criminal before the guy can respond. Just then, someone appears, one of the brides of the university vice president named L. Rose, the same girl the protagonist was looking for. She asks what's going on. The protagonist blushes at her beauty but then smiles and hands his identification to her. The girl realizes it's the identification of her fiancé, Linen, which surprises her because her grandfather wasn't kidding when he said he had a fiancé for her. Ignoring these thoughts, she rudely tells the protagonist that he's there to marry her. He responds that they certainly won't get married immediately but they can start as friends. He thinks she's the kind girl he likes and gets excited. He says there will be no refund because marriage is not something that can be refunded. While he is lost in his thoughts, the man asks about his identity and says he is not worthy of the lady. He shows friendliness towards the protagonist but not towards the girl, smiling as he greets both. When she sees the man's car parked almost at the entrance, 
she asks him to park it in the parking space. Senor S tells her not to worry as he has reserved a newly opened restaurant and plans to go with her, asking if she wants to try it. However, the girl declines the invitation as she has a meeting with the Ministry of Education and fears she may not make it. She then looks at the protagonist and tells him she will accompany him to his office as they will discuss the matter in detail. However, when the girl mentions the protagonist's name, he ends up recognizing it and wonders if Lin is an enemy of his brother or if he has come to connect with him. However, looking at the protagonist, he dismisses this idea as he is very different from the casual nature of Kem's game. He must marry her to have connections with the government in the hands of the Lan family, one of the four main families of Anshan. He asserts that if the protagonist interferes, he will see what he is capable of. In Miss Lore's room, she asks the protagonist if he went to see his grandfather and he responds that the girl has not yet gone. Upon hearing this, she says it's better that way since it's a matter between the two of them and she doesn't want a third person to intervene. She becomes serious and confesses to the protagonist that she doesn't want to marry him. Linfen smiles and says it's okay because he will never force her, let alone pressure. They exchange phone numbers, and the girl is surprised at how easy it is to talk to the protagonist, wondering if he really won't use the marriage contract to force her. Hours pass, and at noon that day, after settling everything, the protagonist asks the girl if he can buy her ramen. She agrees and says she's happy he's willing to invite her, making it clear that it's not a requirement. However, the protagonist has no money, and the girl asks for a small ramen. He responds that he is unemployed and doesn't have much money, which surprises her. The girl's attempts to ask something to the protagonist are interrupted by a bald man who starts shouting in the place. They turn to see what is happening and realize that the bald man is yelling at the protagonist, asking him to kneel and bow three times, threatening to rip off an arm or a leg. The protagonist asks the man to calm down so as not to leave a bad impression on his friends, referring to the girl. However, the girl is worried about what Lin Fena will do. Before taking any action, the bald man tells her to wait and then turns to the wealthy man, saying he is unemployed but is a military doctor. He suggests that if she marries him, he can keep his promises. This apparently impresses the girl, who asks the protagonist if he is a doctor, but he clarifies that he is a military doctor. Meanwhile, he wonders what the point of bringing it up now is while holding the bald man's shoulder. The protagonist confirms what the girl said, that he is a military doctor and very good at it, especially in constructing human skeletons. He warns the bald man to be careful, and with a swift movement, he instantly breaks his arm, making him scream in pain. The men accompanying the bald man are impressed because they couldn't even see when the protagonist broke his arm. They end up leaving their boss behind. The girl is also impressed by what the protagonist did, as the bones and joints of young adults are very strong and rarely dislocate easily. She asks how bones can dislocate when touched. The protagonist tests the bald man, asking him to touch his arm, which he does immediately, causing him to scream in pain. However, when the protagonist lightly taps his shoulder, the pain disappears, and he claims to no longer feel any pain. He puts the dislocated arm back in place causing the bully to ask why he dislocated it again. The protagonist doesn't answer and asks the girl if it's fun. The bully bows to the protagonist and apologizes, admitting he made a mistake. The bald man, with tears in his eyes, reveals that it was Mr. S who sent him and gave him 10,000 to humiliate the protagonist in front of the girl. The girl says he deserved only an injury, and as the protagonist adjusts the bald man's arm, he agrees. The bully thanks the protagonist several times and gives him money before leaving with tears in his eyes. The protagonist suggests they could eat somewhere nice, but the girl informs that they already ordered the food so they need to finish first. She finds the protagonist interesting, but receives a call from her grandfather who asks her to accompany him to meet him at home after dinner. The protagonist agrees to accompany her without any issues. When they arrive at the girl's house, they notice the presence of many security guards guarding the place. The girl's grandfather is happy to see her but is surprised to notice Linfen's presence, to whom he reveals belongs to a special department of the National Secret Army and is a member of the ATM organization. This impresses the girl, who asks her grandfather if the protagonist is one of the dead doctors from NCK. The grandfather confirms and questions if she thinks she would find a normal man to be her fiancé. The girl gets excited and approaches the protagonist to ask him to tell her about the country's number one dead doctor, 
who is her idol. However, Linfen can't respond well to her words since the girl had buried the protagonist's arm in her chest, which distracts him. When the girl's grandfather realizes what's happening, he reprimands her to pay attention to her actions, and she becomes very embarrassed. He asks the protagonist if his father told him about his situation, something the protagonist denies. The old man then reveals that he has three children, the oldest being the head of the third division of the Hidden Legion and the second vice chief. This impresses the protagonist, who asks what the third division is because according to his information, that sector was annihilated in a single operation and no one survived. The grandfather confirms this but says that the third son dedicated himself to business and didn't get involved in those things. R is his only daughter and granddaughter who currently works in the first division of the Hidden Legion. Changing the subject a bit, the old man reveals to the protagonist that he hasn't introduced himself yet, saying that he is, the one, and has just retired from the first division of the Hidden Legion. The protagonist interrupts and says it's a coincidence that they both retired, which leads the old man to affirm that the protagonist is young and that they did the equivalent of 100 years of work of 100 elite members of the Hidden Legion. However, the protagonist doesn't want to continue talking about this subject and asks a favor of the old man, which is not specified. Later, the protagonist meets Ru Jean who tells him that her parents called her to inform that the Ministry of Commerce rejected the $300 million contract and they may face a large payment for damages. She believes the protagonist is responsible for this and asks what's going on. Miss Lauro appears and says that everything that's happening is due to her grandfather's pressure and that the protagonist is getting revenge on her. She knows the protagonist, calls him by his name, and asks what he's doing there, implying that he knows things she doesn't. Miss Lauro scolds the protagonist for being with another woman and asks him to stay away from Lan. The protagonist questions why he should do that, knowing her situation, and prefers Lan's company. The girl is upset with the protagonist's attitude and tells him that he's kind. She reveals that she and Lan were in the same class from elementary to high school, sharing information about Lan's behavior. She claims that Lan smokes and drinks and that he's the type of person she likes. The protagonist and the girl almost have the same thought, and he reprimands her, saying that the past doesn't matter because Lan's grandfather is now helping the girl. He advises her not to treat him badly. However, the girl states that she's used to it, although the protagonist doesn't believe her, thinking she's pretending. The girl asks the protagonist to buy something to eat and then come back so she can talk to Ru Jean alone to clarify any misunderstandings. The protagonist agrees to the idea, but before leaving, he warns her to pay attention to her attitude. When the girl is alone with Ru Jean, she reveals that there was indeed a misunderstanding but tells him not to pretend because she has recordings and videos. The thing that makes her take off her glasses and show us her true face as she is, and I say this because the girl now adopts a completely different attitude called bad cow, telling her that she didn't believe she had the skills to commit to the protagonist, and well things are getting interesting. Ru Jean smiled a bit at this and told him that this is her true face and completely changed her attitude, asking her if the protagonist really likes her or if he's with her to harm her while looking at her with a downcast gaze he tells her that he met the protagonist a few hours ago. So what's the point of saying he likes her? Approaching her he said he never stopped thinking about her which makes her think she already knew that since it's a sadistic thing. Then she removes her hand from his face and tells him she thought the protagonist was good and wanted to experience the reason she says this calmly and directly that she is grateful to her grandfather for helping her with words she almost considers a threat as she asks him if he is telling her that the protagonist is hers and that she should stay away from him which is cruel however when he says this he believes that her curiosity about the protagonist leads to blood. And she says that's interesting while thinking that the little cow by saying that only makes it good that she's curious about the protagonist who wants to get closer to him after that time passes and two days later they meet at this luxurious hotel where Lin F met Ruin the protagonist informs the girl that Sun Kimin prevented them from talking here since this hotel is owned by the S family. But as it is not totally safe he tells her to be careful when he passed something to her the girl who was wearing a beautiful and elegant dress curious about what the protagonist gave her asks what it is the protagonist smiles and responds saying it's insurance when they enter the place Kimin was waiting for
for them when he saw them he asked the protagonist and the girl to sit down and asked for the food to be served however. Ru Jin who had broken up with him earlier approached him to say not to bother him since he was alone however he did not let her finish and invited her to sit down and talk while. They ate the protagonist a little insecure takes her shoulder and tells her to sit down and not to worry also saying that this meal is an invitation from Lord San well from Lord San and therefore it should not be cheap after serving the food s prevents them from opening the wine and when they do he tells the heroes and the girl that everything they are seeing including wine is not available the protagonist responds smiling saying it's insurance after they enter the girl even though the wine looks appetizing ends up refusing since she's going to drive so she can't drink however the protagonist tells Roy they can call a driver to take them asking how not to try such good wine she tells him that this wine is champagne and it's very good while she thinks it's indeed a champagne she's never seen it makes it clear that this guy is planning something the protagonist as he passes the glass he came to the girl asking her to drink but the girl remained a little unsure and asked the protagonist if it's safe to drink that wine, wondering if there will be any problem. The protagonist tells her to drink and not to worry, as nothing will happen, and also reminds her that there is insurance covering her if something goes wrong, referring to the pill he gave her earlier as chemic. Upon hearing the girl ask the protagonist if the wine is safe, he tells her it's just a glass of wine and nothing will happen. Having said this, the protagonist wastes no time in starting to drink, just like the girl, and they are chemming as they see they've already started. He thinks and laughs as his plan is going perfectly, revealing that this red wine with spices will make them die in the blink of an eye. Later, they show us how the protagonist and the girl were under the influence of the wine, and they are chemming as they see this, laughing maliciously. While looking at the protagonist, the girl tells him he's not worthy of stealing from a woman and it's a waste of time pouring champagne on him. She then informs someone over the phone to come up, as planned sending him and the woman to room 888 and the other man to room 788. However, the conversation is interrupted by the protagonist inviting the guy to drink. But this was a small distraction as the protagonist ends up pulling out a needle, quickly using it against Keming, and in doing so, he falls asleep in the blink of an eye. The girl, seeing this, comments that fortunately, they have insurance, and if it weren't for that insurance, they would fall into his trap. However, she didn't see when the protagonist took that pill, so she asks him how he could resist the stasis, to which he responds by telling her not to forget that he has studied Chinese medicine. Linfen takes the phone from Keming's hand, saying he will see what he has planned, but upon checking, he looks surprised and then grabs a vial to give him to drink, worrying the girl who asks what he has given him, to which the protagonist tells her it's sildenafil, it won't kill him, just send him to heaven. However, the girl is surprised to hear the name of the vial, knowing very well that what the protagonist is giving to Keming is Viag. The story continues with Linfen asking Miss Rujin to lie on the floor to pretend she's under the influence of the wine. The protagonist asks this of the girl because in the previous video, we could see how the blonde-haired guy called some people to come up where he was, and therefore, after the protagonist gave her this substance, he settled on the table and told her this. After this, we see other people arriving at the place, and these people are the same ones Keming called, but one of them is surprised to see that Keming is also sleeping, asking his companion why Mr. Sun has also fallen. He responds by telling him not to ask about his guest's personal matters and to get to work, which he does immediately. Later, while the protagonist supposedly was sleeping, Someone in the hallway informs that Infen is still sleeping, and Mr. Sun and the others are on the next floor. The problem with going down all those flights of stairs or going up, however, getting to the main subject, the girl, a little concerned, asks the protagonist what they should do now, because if they left, the waiter would certainly stop them, but the protagonist apparently already has it all planned out. Since he ends up taking the girl's hand to put it on his back and tell her that this won't happen since they will follow the usual path, which is either lowering her or jumping out the windows. Upon this, he asks the protagonist if he's sure he can do this, to which he himself responds that she will see if she can or not, words that make the girl decide to follow the protagonist's plan and as she was walking back with the protagonist, she tells him that it would be better if he knew all this. At the moment the girl climbs up, the protagonist manages to feel the girl's enormous melons and before that he tells her that he can't see, but it's a little big, but the girl doesn't know what the pruta is doing. She asks what he means by a little big, asking if he's saying it's heavy and a little upset, he says that if yes, he doesn't carry it and he thinks it's heavy 
but the conspirator when jumping out the window says no. It's like this since she has the right weight to then slow down the fall a little and fall in the most epic way possible and not only does it seem epic to me, but also to the girl who, blushing, thought to herself. That the protagonist is quick and firm and the strength of his arm is incredible, however, as the protagonist was already on the first floor, he asks Ryan to wait for him in the car since he has things to do, which the girl accepts and well, yes. They wonder why the protagonist would stay on the first floor because that's because Sun Kimin was there and he wanted to play a prank on him while carrying him. He tells him to take him to his room and do what he wanted to do with him and as the protagonist himself said he ended up going up to his room and while he was there he commented that he was looking forward to seeing what Kimin had planned for him and while covering his face he says he'll cover it so they don't recognize him and having already said that the protagonist he had planned to leave the place but before doing so he comes across two people and whose people are these two women who are not at all beautiful. Upon seeing him, they immediately approach him and ask if they are there to see Lean Fin, to which Chubby affirms and says that Mr. and turning to his companion, she asks if he will come in now. Everything is according to the previous arrangement, but the portal asks them to wait a minute before entering as it has to tell them something. What it has to tell them is that Mr. Sun specifically explained that he wanted to give In Fen an unforgettable memory and therefore doesn't believe his companion can do it. She asks why she doesn't go to the battle herself. Goldada laughs a little at this and tells the protagonist that it's okay since, for Mr. Sun's sake, she, as the leader of the three golden flowers in E, will be back in the arena that day. These words are very well received by the protagonist, who joyfully tells her that he knew they weren't ordinary people, while the other girl wonders if she might be too heavy for Infen. Finally, the protagonist tells Goldada very seriously that Infen has something on his mind, so she shouldn't remove it, as he has to let the man who caught him open it himself. Well, this completely turns the situation around because what Kimin wanted to do to Infen ended up being done to him, or rather, the protagonist ended up doing it to him. Moments later, we switch to Sun Kimin, who, upon sensing the presence of Algu Aluin, wonders if it's Ruyin, words he says himself. He ends by saying that's how it is, and taking the person's hand, he definitely says, that's right, as the waiter should do what he told him to do. With this said, Sun Keming dives into action, and as he does, he feels like he's on cloud 9, or rather, he feels like he's riding a horse. And since the sensation is so pleasant, he enthusiastically asks for it to continue. However, in the midst of the action, reporters suddenly arrive out of nowhere, along with Goldada's supposed boyfriend, who claims he worked so hard to raise her, only to be deceived. Well, Clearly all this is a setup since Mr. Sun paid them all to pretend. They devised a plot to ruin the protagonist, but sooner or later, they'll realize the tables have turned long ago, and the one lying in bed isn't the protagonist, but Sun Keming, the supposed boyfriend of Goldada. Seeing her, he is left speechless, as he never imagined she would be his supposed girlfriend. But it's not just him who's impressed, the other two are as well. Goldada, knowing her role very well, pretends convincingly, and as she pushes him away, she asks her supposed boyfriend what he's doing there, telling him to hang up the phone and not film this, all the while thinking that these are Mr. Sun's plans. Meanwhile, her supposed boyfriend, with a bewildered expression, wonders if this is really his supposed girlfriend, realizing how difficult it is to earn money, as he has to pretend that this not-so-beautiful Goldita is his girlfriend. This is truly lamentable, but getting to the point, while removing this from his face, he tells the same, clearly thinking that he's the protagonist, that he is a scoundrel and now everyone will see the true face of that wild man. However, as he removes what covered his face, the audience is surprised to realize that it is Sun Keming, who was as naked as the day he was born. It's worth mentioning that he was still under the effect of what the protagonist gave him, so he asks the girl why she isn't coming to continue with the action, but upon realizing that the person semi-naked is Goldada, he wonders with this face if she is the one on top of him now, and with this said, he collapses on the bed, clearly fainting from the shock, but we can't blame him since this situation must be very tough for him. Moving to the Sun Chento family's house, who is the patriarch of the Sun family, upon seeing what just happened to Sun Keming, he fears for his family and, based on this, throws his phone and asks to bring that fool immediate. At the same time, Linfen was happy with what she did, and seeing everything, she wonders if the Sun family will give her money for bringing in so much traffic. The worried Miss Ruin comments to the protagonist that Sun Keming will know it was them who did it and will seek revenge with all his might, 
and she doesn't know if it's a relief that they did all this because now their lives could be in danger, especially the protagonists. Linfen confesses to the girl that the reason the Sun family became one of the four families was not for money but for the ancient martial artists. And the ancient martial artists are physically more powerful than normal people and can kill people invisibly. Standing up confidently, she tells the girl not to worry as she will take care of what worries her because after all, she is the director and her nominal husband, so she has to keep her and her family safe. Later, we move to the CH family's house, where the head of the family asks someone if they are there for the family, and well, that someone is our protagonist, who confirms and tells him that Roa Jean and he have a marriage and friendship contract. Furthermore, although that fake treats others in her own way, she is also responsible for the ending. Well, with all this, the protagonist tells Mr. CH to help him, and he says that in that case, he will do it. He asks why he doesn't bring his daughter along, to which the priest responds saying he doesn't want to be blamed for bigamy, and for those who don't know bigamy, it's the loss and status of a person who enters into a second demonic marriage while the protagonist is already married, as I read the intentions of the old man and asked if he really wants him to cure his daughter, since he quickly realized that she won't live much longer. Words that the agitated old man responds to him saying that if his daughter can be cured, he won't hesitate to give up all the family's properties, however, although the proposal seems convenient, the protagonist, being a good-humored and good person, tells the old man that it's not necessary, because before giving him the 300 million in orders he healed him, and if now he sends someone to protect the family, Yul will cure Cho Jean meaning the protagonist is telling the old man that if he sends people now to take care of his wife and family, he will personally cure his daughter. The old man accepts this with joy, as it definitely suits him. Calling two of his men, he informs them that they will immediately protect the three members of the Yu family. The protagonist. Before the two men leave, he tells them that they must remember to only follow Ruo Jin's orders, as his parents, specifically his mother, are not trustworthy. Moments later, Mr. Chan's daughter enters the room and, a little concerned, asks her father what happened to the Yu family. However, upon seeing her father laughing next to the protet, her expression changes slightly and since then she did not expect the protet to be at her home. She asks the protet with tenderness what he is doing there, she asks something that is not answered by the protagonist because upon seeing her he immediately stops in front of her and stares at her, then directs his what she's wearing since he wants to see her wound in front of the girl. This is somewhat ignored, as the protagonist is acting like a madman. Then he asks distantly what she's looking at, but her father, seeing his daughter's distrust, goes to her and tells her to listen to the protagonist, however, the girl refuses to do so since her wound is on her breasts and therefore asks her father how she can show that to someone and also we have to remember that Linfen is the licensed husband of Rua Jin. And if she does that, she won't have enough words to explain to Rua Jin, but although this is a problem for him, she thinks it is for the Pratano, since hello, the same as don't worry saying that, as a professional doctor, his professionalism will make him see a piece of. Seldo meet words that end up bothering the girl who asks her father if the protagonist called her Seldo to which he replies telling her not to worry about that and had to take the plot to her bedroom so that he could see her said this Linfen tells the girl to hurry as her time is precious thing her father affirms and he also tells her that for the sake of her father if he can really cure himself then he would die without regrets. Which makes the girl with a trembling voice tell her father not to talk not nonsense telling him so she will let the protagonist see her shortly after we confirm that the protagonist took her for examination but during the examination the girl made strange noises and also complained because the protagonist was touching her too much after a while Linen ends up with the girl and the gentleman seeing the protagonist coming down asks him how it went the protagonist replies telling him that he will write a prescription and send it to him by chat to use once in the morning and once at night and then he will do acupuncture which the gentleman thanks him for after a while that same afternoon Ruo Jean contacts the prot and asks him if he hired two bodyguards sent by the CH family which the pewtel affirms and tells him that after all she is his wife Ru Jean before this I made Linfen that he is not in the mood for jokes since the family. He has just arrived and said that they wouldn't do anything to her and they would only take revenge on him, and thus the girl asks the protagonist what he will do now, or if he already has a way to deal with. Linfen, as always, tells her not to worry and comments that the reason they don't touch her is because they have seen the two bodyguards she now has, and that's why they know they can't touch her. As for him, he tells the girl not to worry because they still can't hurt him. Nevertheless, Linfen hangs up the call after saying this, and upon hanging up, 
the girl immediately approaches him to ask if he can lend her some money since she has lost her wallet and her mobile phone. However, Linfen, knowing the ways of this world, doesn't easily buy into stories like that. So, with cunning, he asks her to tell him a family member's phone number so they can transfer the money and she can withdraw it. The girl, named Alisai, tells Linfen that she can't do that because she's running away from home, thus asking him for a favor again. She asks him to lend her only $100 and, taking him by the arm provocative, tells him she will stay with him all night, solely at his disposal, for whatever the protagonist wants. This prompts Linfen to ask if she really intends to do that, saying she'll have to see how it looks and prove she's not dirty. At this point, it's unclear what he's referring to, but the important thing here is that when the protagonist touches her hand, he realizes the girl is a master since she possesses the peak of dark energy at an early stage, and her control over Ki is high. Therefore, she must have practiced a powerful concealment technique. As the girl walks away, telling him it's not fun, Linfen continues to think and deduces that she must be, well, she must be an assassin sent by the family. However, even though Linfen knows all this, he acts as if he doesn't, asking her if she's a student in love with him, and if that's her objective. He tells her it won't work and bids her farewell. But when the girl sees which way Linfen is going, she says that direction is a deserted suburban road, more like a dead-end alley. Knowing this, the girl wastes no time and launches herself at the protagonist. However, with a quick movement, Linfen dodges her, surprising the girl since the protagonist is very fast. Although Linfen already knew what the girl was planning, he tells her she didn't come to make him fall in love but to kill him. This prompts the girl, in a fighting stance, to tell him to stop fooling around and let her earn some money easily. Saying this, the girl again rushes at the protagonist, but her attack is not effective as the protagonist easily stops her. Then giving her a tremendous kick with so much force that it made her bleed and standing in front of her, he says that what she did is the result of being a jack of all trades, asking if she's still a killer a question the girl can't manage to understand. He quickly throws a needle at her, but the protagonist ends up stopping the needle with just two fingers. The girl then tells herself that she knew she should have listened to her mother and stayed home, since she didn't, she expects to die. In her first mission, her thoughts are interrupted by Linfen, who comes to ask if he's part of the family and if so, he wants to know how many of them are there, asking where the others are, a question that again is no longer answered by the girl. Being tough, he tells him, to stop the nonsense, since he only wanted to take her life, but Linfen, seeing that she's struggling to speak, bringing a soul forth, tells her that he likes it, saying he hopes to endure the rest of the interrogation to which the trembling girl responds that he has the ability, so he must do it quickly and without pain, but that's no fun for the protagonist, as it won't work if he does it like that, since she can't die, until he responds with information, he dislocated the arm like this on top, the girl, seeing that he broke her arm, called him a bastard, but he, the protagonist tells her not to worry, as he's just dislocated to prevent her from attacking while they have fun, and then proceeds to remove the mask covering her face, and upon doing so, we realize that the girl is indeed beautiful, however, as the protagonist stares at her, he wonders why she seems somewhat familiar, he takes out his phone, searches for something, shows it to her, and asks if the girl in the photo is her, to which she confirms. She then asks the protagonist why he has her photo, and he responds by calling her by her name, which is Dukin, and asking her if she's heard of Linfen, leaving the girl astonished. She then asks Linfen if it could really be true that he is her fiancé, saying she thought they just shared the same name but turns out it's the same person. However, Linfen, upon hearing all this, laments and says it's over, as if her father finds out he beat up the fiancé he found for him, he might do the same to him. Since the situation is now tense, he acts kindly and asks the girl if she can still stand up, offering to help her. However, the girl rejects this off, telling him to get lost and not touch her, and furthermore, she says she wants to break up with him because, according to her, the protagonist is a domestic abuser, and therefore, she'd rather die than marry him. The protagonist, hearing the girl asking him to leave, is relieved by this and tells her it's fine and that he should forget about their marriage. He suggests she should remember to tell her family that she was the one who proposed breaking up first, but before leaving, Linfen advises the girl to give up on the mission to kill him. However, the girl doesn't back down in the presence of the protagonist and responds by saying it's impossible, to which Linfen argues that he's usually very pleasant to talk to, but she shouldn't take advantage of that skill, or else she'll die. However, 
as the girl doesn't retract her statement and tells the protagonist that he's the one who will die, and he won't be the only one. After parting ways with the girl, Linfin encounters Miss Lan R while walking, who invites him to get in the car as her grandfather is looking for him. Later, we move to the mansion of the L family, where the protagonist asks the old man what's going on, to which he responds very seriously that they found the whereabouts of Lunian, information that shocks the protagonist, as Lunian is the same traitor from the Night of the Dead. The old man continues to inform the protagonist that Lunian appeared in Yanan, in the Guan village to be specific, in front of Wan Lin's tomb. Lin Fen, somewhat annoyed by this, says that if it weren't for her, Wan Lin wouldn't have died, asking if she really had the nerve to visit his tomb. However, that's not all the information the old man has for the protagonist, as he shows him his phone and tells him that she deliberately left a memory card there with a video. Watching the video, Lin Fen hears how the girl calls him boss and says she regrets not being able to meet him face to face since she's the person who knows him best and he won't be able to live for more than 10 seconds with her, as during the first 5 seconds, he'll remember his past, then spend 2 seconds doubting, and then think of Wan Lin, before taking his life. But before saying goodbye, she informs Lin Fen that she left some things for him on his familiar website along with a password, and with that, she bids farewell. After watching this, the old man tells Lin Fen that he needs him to find what the girl gave him and deliver it, which he immediately does. While searching, he wonders what information she could have left him. Seconds later, Lin Fen finds what the girl left him, which was another video where she tells him the route she took to escape after stealing the information in the first place, and then asks him if he understands, as the Hidden Legion still has undercover agent's words that make the prototype understand why it was easy for her and therefore it's no wonder she escaped so casually however, the video continues and the girl tells him she doesn't know who the undercover agents are and therefore suggests he use a voice changer and it's good so there won't be any harm in trying to find out the old man upon hearing this. He asks Lin Fen why the girl beat around the bush so much to talk about an undercover agent, which Lin Fen responds to, saying it's because she was going to get rid of all her competitors and take the cake alone and as for beating around the bush so much because the girl knows he is retired and wanted to force him to contact them again forcing him back onto that path and as he looked up at the sky he argues that he will then accept the request and last but not least. He tells the old man to let him know when he finds his exact location so he can personally go and take his life nevertheless, Lin Fen is. Interrupted by a message and whose message said that Alan has just stealthily attacked but was hit by the guards of the CH family and what he just saw well what he just taught him is a video recorded by surveillance Lin Fen upon seeing who it is remembers what happened to him and therefore based on this he asks the old man if by any chance he knows anything about the Sun family since they went to provoke him. Which the old man replies and tells him that it's not worth mentioning the Sun family, since with their strength they can naturally erase it easily but if he doesn't want to owe a favor to him for helping him clean up he can do it another way words that arouse the curiosity of the prototype which asks the old man how he could do this he informs that Sun Chento's wife is the illegitimate daughter of the second son of the Gai family and in him. He is a true tycoon at the provincial level and the Sun family is in the eyes of the Wei family in the city of Yang and apart from 40% of the training places in his city of Yang are in the hands of Yen and Yin of the Yi family in J. Dutby commenting that the Yi family and the Wei family have a feud and have been openly and secretly fighting for years and therefore if the Prot wants the Sun family to disappear he must use Yejin the protagonist after hearing all this he laughs a bit and says it's a conflict in an ant's nest and therefore he finds the story super. Interesting the story continues at the Narcissus Club 7th floor where this beautiful girl in a red dress realizes someone and to whom she asks if her security guards are still alive this person was our protagonist who tells her that of course his guards are still alive and just gave them a break to go eat something helping them fight for employee rights the girl whose name is not revealed to us thanks the protagonist for his kindness however. As the girl is unaware of the protagonist she asks who he is to which the protagonist kindly introduces himself as Lin Fun. She he asks who our protagonist is, he introduces himself as Fei, and she is the ex of the Jay family, who is also in conflict with the Saman family. From what he tells her, she realizes that he wants the Sam family to deal with their own issues, thus he wants the Jake family to take the blame. She thinks it's not good for the Jake family to be under the watchful eyes of the S family, but our protagonist, understanding that she doesn't want to help him, 
tells her that if she seeks another way, she will end up destroying the Sam family. She realizes that our protagonist is not joking when saying these words, so it doesn't seem like a joke. Thus, she didn't plan to let our protagonist ruin her hard work, so she didn't want to refuse his request as she could die immediately. He asks her to take a picture of him, and our protagonist accepts without hesitation. A hacker sends him the photo of our protagonist but then tells him that his identity is highly encrypted so it can't be traced at all. Upon learning this, he realizes that our protagonist's identity is top level, which could mean that he has an extremely powerful background working for the state. This makes cooperation risky and delicate, but he accepts our protagonist's request. Our protagonist tells him that he will contact him again later. The boy from the Sam family was quite worried because after sending Senorita Du, he didn't know what to do with our protagonist. However, as they knocked on the door, the sweet lady was very worried because she didn't know who it was and jumped out the window. However, after jumping, she was caught by our protagonist who did it on purpose knowing that she would jump. All this happened because our protagonist had things to discuss with her. He let her fall into an armchair in Ruben's house. Our protagonist asked her to pick up the phone and call home, but Senorita Du refused. However, when pressed, which made her quite shy, our protagonist asked her if she wasn't going to call, seriously ended up taking the phone from her back pocket. After taking the phone, our protagonist on top of her said she smelled very good for someone who was a murderer. Our protagonist ended up calling her father, telling him that he knows she has a mission to kill him but warned him that he had found out something her father told him to call Senorita Du's family to pick her up. Her father told him that he should only have a child with her, and after the child was born, he would never let her go for fear that our protagonist would make her have a child. Senorita Du said that if he did that and her mother found out, she would never let him go. Hugen ended up arriving, telling our protagonist who she was because he had never brought a strange girl with him. Our protagonist tells her that she was the one who tried to kill him, however, he brought her there to solve the problem, to which the lady, quite deluded, thinks she only knew as a little girl. However, the lady quickly threatens our protagonist with a nail saying that if he did anything, she would kill Hugin with that nail, but she quickly ended up being immobilized by the two men who were sent to Rujin's family to protect them. Our protagonist didn't hesitate to act, so they ended up overpowering Senorita Du, seeing that they were quite ahead. Senorita Du ended up agreeing to make the call, which left Rujin quite doubtful because he wondered who Senorita Du would call. She ended up introducing herself, saying that she was from the fiancé of our protagonist, Hugin wondered if she really was his fiancée, but our protagonist ends up telling her that the marriage had already been rejected. When making the call, Senorita Du knew it was the only option she had to get out of the situation, but her mother on the phone said that he only called her when he had problems. However, our protagonist took the phone and introduced himself to Senorita Du's mother. She asked our protagonist if he was Feng Shen's son, to which he, he replied yes, saying that Miss Du had already tried to kill him, but he let her go. However, she returned and said that only if Miss Du's mother asked, he would let her go, but if she kept insisting, he would kill her without hesitation. His mother ended up insulting Fong, saying that he was very arrogant, but our protagonist handed the phone to Miss Du, telling her she could go. Miss Du ended up accepting, thinking that our protagonist was quite fierce and truly believing that he would be responsible for killing the sweet Miss Marceau. She gave our protagonist her phone number so he could call if he needed help, since the call would be free, in other words, he wouldn't be charged. Our protagonist ended up receiving a message. This message was a secret number telling him that the next day would be the 8th anniversary of Gu Shanghai and the Sam family would attend. So our protagonist knew that it was a good day for the family not to disappear. He knew that Miss Rogan would go to the parties, however, he didn't know that she knew details of how she planned to assassinate the family. I mean, I didn't want to tell him, but the next day, at the Yu family mansion, our protagonist ended up arriving with the lady. However, after they entered, someone arrived arrogant, saying that any dog or cat could enter the family mansion, making our protagonist realize what the family was involved in. They had a little argument when they entered, but our protagonist thought it would be the end of the family. They were already inside the mansion of the family head, and he started to ask everyone for their help. Our protagonist then told him that he had asked Rogan not to go and congratulate the gentleman. However, she told him that she believed she was not qualified to congratulate him on his birthday, instructing him to use that party only to meet people and make new connections. Hidden from our protagonist, a girl asked him if he had been responsible for assaulting her security guard the other day, but our protagonist denied knowing her, 
saying she was confusing people. It was Jesse who ended up throwing the drink in his face. Rogan, quite upset, asked Jesse why she did that, but Jesse told him it was because she wanted him. Our protagonist asked Rogan to calm down since he was fine and to continue with her business without further ado. Our protagonist ended up saying goodbye because he wanted to change, however, Ezen ended up going after him at the same time as the Sam family toasted everyone due to the fake argument with Jess, the boy from the Sam family, that is, Ezen thought our protagonist had dared to provoke a person as evil as he was, saying he was doomed. But the truth was that the countdown for the San family had begun, something that this old man who had just returned knew. The vehicle stopped, which left Rogan quite worried about a guy approaching. He ended up breaking the window. They ended up taking the kidnapped girl and also leaving her unconscious. After that, Reuben was tied up in a warehouse, waking up realizing that our protagonist had also been kidnapped by Jesse. Our protagonist asked him why he was following him, but Rogan, quite worried, asked our protagonist if they were going to die. A guy arrived where Rogan was, and our protagonist told him he had to leave. However, Rogan thought our protagonist was into killing, so he didn't want to let him go. But our protagonist told him not to worry and that he would return safely. They showed us that before the party, Miss Ezen had met with the San family. Mr. Sun wanted Miss Jess to take the blame for kidnapping our protagonist, and along with Rogan, she told him that the price was millions. However, the head of the S family refused to pay the 800 million. But Jesse, quite determined, told him that even if he didn't pay the 800 million, the deal would be cancelled. But the youngest son of the San family, the family asked the father to pay the amount because he wanted revenge, and our protagonist Gene seemed quite grateful for the boy stealing from his father to pay. We see that after the party, it was quite certain that the girl Essen would go with our protagonist, along with Gene, to deliver them to them. However, on the way, the artist Marcial ran away, the San family's bodyguard, realized that someone was on the road. They were quite worried because it seemed to be the number one of the Night of the Dead, that is, our protagonist. The artist Martial and the bodyguard were wondering if he was an imposter, but the boy from the family was asking why he was pretending to be him. However, without words and without our protagonist wavering, he demonstrated his power by hanging the artist Martial and the family's bodyguard. He knew it was really our protagonist, that is, Dr. Death. The car then lost control and headed towards a cliff. After falling off the cliff, the boy from the S family was half dead, asking for help. But as he lit a lighter, our protagonist caused a huge explosion in the S family's car. The S family boy was quite scared because he was going to die. But as our protagonist saw this, he ended up taking off the mask, leaving the S family boy quite surprised because it was our protagonist. Step by step, our protagonist pleaded with him, saying he was very wrong, but while his father and brother were already dead, he believed our protagonist was actually Dr. Death, saying this much to our protagonist. The morning sun bathed the city with its golden rays, announcing a new day. The tranquility of the urban landscape, however, was abruptly interrupted by a sudden screech of brakes and the sound of blaring horns. Cars jostled for space on the asphalt, creating a scene of chaos and confusion. A woman, wearing a vibrant yellow dress, was getting up from the ground, apparently having fallen out of one of the vehicles. She ordered the man to get out of the car. A man, dressed in an elegant blue suit, awkwardly emerged from the car, clearly stunned by the incident. The woman, with wide eyes and showing concern, called out to him, Feng Lin. With rapid breathing and showing great concern, she questioned him about his whereabouts and the reason he didn't return home the previous night, saying he nearly worried her to death. Feng Lin, with downcast eyes and visible marks on his face, responded that nothing had happened to him. The woman, still distressed by the situation, shifted the focus of the conversation, demanding explanations about the incident and what he had done with Ye Xin. Feng Lin then revealed that Ye Xin was also his fiance, but he had called off the wedding. However, she didn't accept the breakup and kidnapped them. The woman, incredulous at his response, firmly stated that it was a lie. Incredulity spread across the woman's face as she questioned Feng Lin about the number of fiancés he had. Without responding, Feng Lin was taken aback by an unexpected action. The woman, with a determined expression, got into the car and sped away, leaving Feng Lin behind. The man, Amidst the dust raised by the car, expressed his surprise with a simple, 
A. Still not understanding the situation, Feng Lin questioned the sudden change in the woman's behavior and the reason for her sudden decision, pleading for her to take him along too. As the dust settled and the sound of the engine faded away, Feng Lin, with a cold and calculating look, affirmed to himself that now everything was over. Far from there, the news of a car accident on the outskirts of the city made the headlines of the day. The impact had been so severe that the vehicle was completely destroyed, making the scene horrifying. The Song family, shocked upon learning of the accident, read the details attentively. The news reported that the accident involved the Yea family and that Ye Shin, owner of the nightclub Narcissus, had been summoned to testify. The police suspected the nature of the accident, raising hypotheses of a possible settling of scores. The matriarch of the Song family, still in shock, commented to her husband about the tragedy. She felt relieved that her family was safe, but recognized the fatality that had happened to Ye Shin, even though she felt no gratitude towards the girl. The patriarch of the Song family, still incredulous, revealed to his wife that the driver who died in the accident was named Huang Wei. He questioned how Huang Wei, an excellent martial artist and one of the strongest members of their family, could have died in a car accident. The news and the circumstances of Huang Wei's death left the Song family even more confused. Meanwhile, Feng Lin arrived home, escorted by a group of elegant men. He thanked them for sending someone to pick him up. The men, with respectful smiles, downplayed the situation, saying it was just a small favor. Inside the Song family residence, the patriarch kindly offered a Cantonese-style morning tea to Feng Lin, praising his chef's talent. Feng Lin, however, politely declined the offer. He had other plans for that moment and preferred to check on how Zhou Zian was doing. Meanwhile, elsewhere, a butler announced the arrival of the Song family to his master. They were about to meet. The elegant woman beside the patriarch of the Song family introduced herself to the butler. She was Wei Yanzi, wife of Song Zheng Dao. As the Song family prepared to meet the master of the place, one particular detail caught the butler's attention. It was a peculiar tattoo on the patriarch's hand. Intrigued, the butler recognized the symbol, Nine Ghosts. That mark carried significant meaning and sparked curiosity about the story behind that family. The patriarch of the Song family clenched his fist tightly, emanating a powerful aura that made the Nine Ghosts tattoo glow intensely. The image of the tattoo expanded, revealing its full form in a vibrant red, like burning flames. Meanwhile, in a not-so-distant location, a woman with dark hair and tactical clothing was observing everything attentively. She knew the significance of that tattoo and the danger it represented. Nine Ghosts a malevolent organization hiding in the shadows, and the undercover agent Liu Nian was getting closer to uncovering their secrets. Back at the mansion, the butler couldn't contain his concern. He wondered if the Wei family had any relationship with the Nine Ghosts, and this doubt was gnawing at his insides. Determined to get answers, he goes to Zhou, a trusted man of the family, and questions him about who in Jiang City would have enough power to burn Huang Wei, such a powerful martial artist, to death hinting at the connection with the organization and the possible threat that hung over them. Wei Yanzi, noticing the distrust in Zhou's voice, promptly reassures him, denying any suspicions. She explains that her question was just to find out if any powerful masters had recently arrived in Jiang City. To illustrate his point, Wei Yanzi looks suggestively at Feng Lin, implying that his presence there was not a mere coincidence. The patriarch of the Song family, demonstrating that he knows Wei Yanzi's game, interrupts the conversation, claiming that they needed to have breakfast. Feng Lin, with a wry smile, thought to himself about the Song family's ability to play dumb in the face of the situation. With a nod to the butler, he leaves for breakfast, leaving an atmosphere of mystery and distrust in the air. As the Song family leaves, the master of the mansion stands up from his chair with a serious expression. He walks slowly, revealing his dissatisfaction with the unexpected visit and the boldness of the organization. He thought with a cold and calculating look, Since your nine ghosts men have come to me, it is time for the silent night to awaken. The determination in his eyes indicated that the Song family's visit and the nine ghosts' provocation had triggered a series of events that would not end well. The deadly night, 
The most powerful team in the Hidden Legion had gathered, answering their master's call. Each of the team's seven members was a specialist in one area of combat, possessing superhuman abilities, capable of defeating a hundred enemies alone. Throughout their service, they had completed more than a hundred top-secret missions, surpassing any other group in number and success. The reputation of the Deadly Knight preceded them, and its mere presence inspired fear and awe. They were the master's secret weapon, ready to face any threat. But time had passed, and two years ago, the Deadly Knight was undone. Dark reasons hovered over the team, such as the betrayal of Liu Nian, number three, and the death of Wang Lin, number six. The team, once a symbol of power and efficiency, had become a bitter memory. However, at that moment, the Deadly Knight was being awakened. The master, Determined to deal with the threat of the Nine Ghosts and the audacity of the Song family, reactivated his secret weapon. As Deadly Knight prepared to act, Feng Lin made a call, seeking help from an old acquaintance. He said with an urgent tone in his voice, Lao Si, I need your help. The call was crucial to Feng Lin's plans, and he hurriedly climbed the stairs, ready to put his plan into action. The movement in the Song family mansion indicated that something big was coming. Feng Lin, still with the phone to his ear, arrives at his destination and knocks lightly on the door. A soft voice on the other side allows you to enter. Inside the room, a dark-haired woman dressed in a delicate nightgown was lying on the bed. Drowsy, she asks them to leave breakfast on the table, as she needs to sleep a little longer. Feng Lin, with a mischievous smile on his face, thought to himself, How about if I put you on the table now? Startled by Feng Lin's sudden entry, the woman sits on the bed, quickly covering herself with the duvet. She exclaims, visibly surprised, Feng Lin, why did you come in? With a calm smile, Feng Lin replies, You were the one who ordered us in. Confused, the woman questions what he was doing there, as it was not customary for him to visit her in her quarters. Keeping the, with an amused smile on her face, Feng Lin responds ironically that she had come to take care of her, imagining that she was hungry. Outraged by her nephew's boldness, the woman orders him to leave so that she can change room, leaving her alone. However, and regretting the case, this is how we will end this video. But if you liked it, leave a like. If you want the continuation, leave your comment below. And remember, it's very good that the lazy soul wants everything but achieves.